do you want to talk about today? I get various requests about uh, what was going on in New York at a certain point in time. So one of the big things that uh, people always ask me for is New York City liquidator stories. So there's a whole story in itself about how I got involved in that situation. You see, um, the owner, Norman Brill, became very close with me. We were almost like brothers. Um, of course, he was a little older than me, a little wi I can't say a little wiser, but he knew the streets. And the first time I had heard about him was when he had this big store up on Broadway called Norman's House of Deals. Now, I had a friend of mine who was into horses. He had a string of ponies. Norman had a string of ponies, so I guess that's where they met. So, this friend of mine, Jerry, tells me that this guy he knows in New York has sharp 27-inch color TVs for a really good price. All right, so I'm interested. Buddy of mine's interested. Pick me up one. Okay, so I need two of these TVs. So I meet Jerry in uh, New Jersey, then follow him over to New York at, I don't know, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, and we go to this place on Broadway called Norman's House of Deals. Now, of course, he tells me to wait outside and they'll bring him out, and there was a reason for that was because I'm sure that he added on to the price. I don't remember exactly what the price was, but the price was right, no matter what he added on. So, I had heard of this place, Norman's House of Deals, and I had heard they were doing uh, a lot of weird shit, like pretty much buying uh, stolen stereo equipment and then changing the packaging and uh, trying to sell it as refurbished or something like that. But anyway, the big story with Norman's House of Deals was that he was selling counterfeit Rolex watches. And I don't know if there's any news footage available of this or anything, but what happened was he got busted. It was a federal bust. They closed him down. They took all the watches and dumped them in the street in front of the store, and a steamroller went over him. So um, I had heard that story, but, you know, until later on, never put two and two together. So supposedly he went to some smaller store after he got, you know, everything was straightened out, you know, legally, and he went to some smaller store. Well, you know, like I said, my whole interest back in the day was VHS tapes, and some guy came in with a list of tapes that uh, were all, like, new releases. This was at a warehouse I used to hang out at. So I'm like, wow, let me see this stuff. So I'm, you know, I'm seeing stuff like, okay, I'm, I remember one title, uh, the Dolph Lundgren film, Red Scorpion. So figure whenever that was out, that's when this happened. Probably in the early 80s. Or, you know, around that anyway, mid-80s. I, I can't remember. But anyway, I ordered a bunch of these. After I made a phone call to a video distributor saying I could, you know, get these, and I forget what they were going to cost me, but I added on $2 a tape because the guy was going to buy a couple hundred of them. So, all right, when the guy shows up with the tapes, they're not the originals. They're in these Amore cases, the wraparound cases. And I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me. I can't sell this shit to a fucking store. What are you, nuts? So we go back and forth, because obviously he had added on, you know, and he wasn't going to get his. And I'm like, well, guess what? Bring him back to wherever you got him from, because there's no way I can do anything with this shit. So he inadvertently lets it slip the address of the place and the guy who runs it, Norman. All right, so I file that on my mental Rolodex, because I'm over on uh, West 27th Street every Sunday, because... That was where I got all my stuff, up off of Broadway, West 27th Street, a couple places, one place called Tepti Trading, another place that I got socks from, another place called uh, Cowboy Trading, where I got electronics from, and Cowboy Trading had a house brand called Kobe, which is still around. So, uh, okay, one Sunday I'm over there and I think, let me, let me check this place out. So I drive down to the bottom of West 27th Street close to 8th Avenue, and there is this big old beat-up store called New York City Liquidators. We buy and sell anything. All right, so I go in, and I introduce myself to this guy who's about, you know, five feet nothing, shock of white hair. Tell him Tony sent me, because actually the guy's name was Tony that sent me. So he asked me what I did. I told him. He gives me a price on some porn. Um, I had some batteries from a deal that uh, a buddy of mine got me roped into, of course. There was another little story with that, too. I asked him, he had Duracell batteries, alkaline batteries, and I said, I'm interested, but they got to be blister-packed. He goes, oh, yeah, they're blister-packed. Well, they were in packs of 20. 
So I'm like, you know, I said, this ain't what I was really looking for. So again, another argument ensues. And I go, I'm going to be the better fucking man here. I took the things and left. Of course, John called me up the day after I did this and said, look, I'll take them back. We shouldn't have fought. And I said, well, let me see if I can get rid of them. So I offered him to Norman. And I know I lost on the deal, but it opened the door that, okay, I can wheel and deal. So um, he was my source for all, you know, he, he became like a one-stop shopping, for lack of better words, because when I had my, my video store past my midnight video, I needed used movies, especially horror and cult movies and things like that, because that was my clientele. But I also sold a shitload of porn, and he had a shitload of porn. So every Sunday I would pull over there, because you could park on that block on Sundays, what I didn't know at the time when I first started dealing with him, he was only open on Sundays from September till December to cage the Christmas trade. So one day I'm, I'm in there and I go, I'll see you next Sunday. He goes, yeah, 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 well, well just wave when you drive past because we're going to be closed. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I only do this, you know, I said, okay, I, I get it. So now it became, you know, a, a type of thing where he would call me when he bought out stores. And sometimes this was in midweek. So basically I would leave my fucking house at like, six o'clock in the morning to make the hour ride to try to get past the Route 3 bridge before the traffic built up and get there at um, seven o'clock or whatever. He opened at seven at one point, but then it was like 7.30. So problem with the weekdays is you only had basically a half hour to shop or you were going to get ticketed or towed, and the ticket was pretty weighty there. So there was a small parking lot up the block, and I, you know, introduced myself to the guy, and I said, look, I'm, every once in a while I'm going to have to do this. Can we cut a deal? So he basically, you know, as long as he had my keys and could move the damn thing somewhere, 20 bucks for as long as I wanted to stay there, which was pretty good. Plus, I think, you know, he, he knew Norman, and Norman was, like, throwing something to him here and there and everything. So while this was going on, however, um... There was a lot of tapes that he had behind the counter under glass, which were new releases. And I thought, oh, this is cool. Uh, what I didn't really know was that they were bootlegs. And they were good bootlegs because you really couldn't tell. Because he had um, documented the dead back there, and I wanted to see it. He charged me $15 for it. I got it home. It was fine. Um, no problem. Uh, the box, you know, looked original and everything. But um, that was what he was doing. And... I wasn't really interested in that type of shit except a movie once in a while for myself because he was getting 15 bucks for the damn things and my retail, you know, bottom line retail was 10 bucks for anything in the fucking store so it wasn't going to work but like I said, got a lot of deals on porn, got a lot of deals on, you know, close out VHS tapes and when he bought out stores so everything was cool. So, um... A lot of the other guys I was dealing with, see, this is a cutthroat business, you know, who had, you know, it was a bunch of low, low end, low ball tapes that uh, were footballing around. Like, I think I'd stayed in another thing for years. They kept changing the titles, and, you know, uh, hey, John Holmes was, was dead for a couple of years, and he was still coming out on new releases. So that's how the, that business was going. But after a while, you burn yourself out with the junk tapes, and people want better stuff. So what happened was, not only him, but a couple of other people were getting these grab bags of 50 tapes from uh, VCA, Video Corporation of America, because this was back when they were busting people for shipping things like uh, into like, you know, the whole red and blue states. Well, red states were the, back then were the states that you couldn't sell porn in. So the feds were pulling little jobs with people like uh, planting salesmen at these conventions, uh, you know, the, the video shows, and then having a big order and knowing it would be shipped through a certain state, knowing they could get busted. So... VCA got busted and had to pay a huge fine. So to offset the fine, they were selling these grab bags, and I was buying them, you know, basically um, at three bucks a tape and lots of 50. And then they were also doing the duplicating for Magnum Home Video, which had, you know, Mad Doctor of Blood Island, Brain of Blood, uh, Torture Chamber of Dr. Sadism, and a few other things in those nice wraparound boxes. But see, that was another crapshoot, too, because you buy them in lots in boxes of 50. You might have, you know, two or three of them interspersed in there. But then there was a bunch of shit like airplane films and things like that. The thing with Norman, however, was Norman wasn't going to sell. You know, he would sell the porn in a grab bag, but not the other stuff, because he would bust it up and put it on the shelf. So I could go in there and, like, for the three bucks, grab, like, ten Brain of Blood, ten Mad Doctor of Blood Island, ten Torture Chamber of Dr. Sadism, and whatever else I could grab. So that worked out. Um, 
what happened was, you know, everybody was happy, you know, happy, happy, joy, joy, making money with, with these bootleg tapes, but like with everything else, sooner or later, somebody wants to cheap out. And what happened was, a whole slew of these import blank tapes came in from China. They were Spartan, home video. Um, but they said ALK on the, on the door for some reason. I had seen these at a trade show, and I looked at them, and like, you know, I said, I, I don't know, you know, known, unknown thing. But what happened was the bootleggers hopped on this big time, and for every one that was good, there was three that was fucking bad. So one day I go over there, and I, somebody, you know, I used to wind up with a lot of weird shit, and I had a bunch of these uh, tear gas pens. So I said, i got to get rid of these. I offered him to Norm, and he goes, no, 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 i got enough illegal crap going in here. And he goes, see all those tapes in the back? I said, yeah. He goes, take whatever you want for a buck. Well, this was all the stuff that was, you know, quote, the new releases on the bad tapes that couldn't sell. But, all right, for a buck, I wasn't even giving a shit about what was, you know, the blank tape. I was more interested in matching up the box with used tapes that I had, because usually when you buy out stores, you get... One of two things happens. Actually, two things happens. You get a lot of tapes missing boxes, and you get a lot of boxes missing tapes at the end of the day. So I used to have, like, banana boxes full of, you know, the VHS boxes. And what I would do is I had a notebook with, you know, the titles of the, of the movies in the boxes. And I would go over there and spend the day rooting through his endless piles of, you know, unboxed VHS tapes, which I'd buy for a buck. You know, like I said, you know, you, you know a buck becomes ten when you put a box on it. So I was doing that. So, there was a bunch of shit going on. He was real nervous that day, but next week I go back, everything's back to normal, except he's got Fantasia on the counter in Song of the South. And I'm thinking, oh, whatever he claims to have been under, obviously is gone. So, again, all these guys are telling me, you know, you're going over there, the feds are watching the place, they probably got your plate number, you're going to get busted. I'm like, get busted for what? I'm not buying any bootleg shit, I'm just, you know... Hey, if you can match his price, I'll buy, buy you off you. But on some of the stuff, they couldn't match his price. So, I forget what happened. One day, I am working in I know, one of my numerous off-the-books part-time jobs back then. When I get a phone call, you near a TV? Yeah, turn on Channel 7 Eyewitness News. I turn it on, and here, here's this camera crew in front of liquidators, and they're marching everybody out in handcuffs. And I'm like, fuck, they finally got him. So there was a huge thing in the New York Daily News, front page, biggest bootleg bust ever, um, ties to organized crime, uh, told me that they said they confiscated roughly $375,000 in small bills and bags, enough to be a fire hazard. They went over his house and took money, yada, yada, yada. So it was this whole big fucking deal. And I'm like sitting there going, man, they finally fucking got him. But when I saw the... Um, the parade of people being let out of the store in handcuffs, I noticed that he had three Mexican stock boys that weren't in the parade. So I'm like, that was interesting. So um, down the road when I started working there, I said, you know, how did you guys not get busted in that whole thing? And they told me they sort of knew it was coming, so they had bags like shopping bags with merchandise in them. So when the cops came in, they acted like customers and snuck out, which was pretty smart because they all wound up in the tombs. Funny story about that was I found out later on that, you know, Norman thought he had a slick lawyer, but basically they were all stuck down there for three days except for Cousin Mark who realized i got to get my own lawyer, I'm going to be stuck here. So like I said, Norman was about this tall and he was in this cage, so all these fucking cons are yelling, Louie, get me a cab, call me a cab. So I heard that and I, you know, I wasn't supposed to repeat that story around him because it pissed him off, but it's pretty funny when you think of it. So... One Sunday, I'm up at the other end of the block at Tep T Trading when somebody comes in and goes, hey, Norm's down there. He just opened up again. I'm like, well, fuck, i got to go down and see what's going on. So I drove down, and I walked in. I said, dude, you know, I'm really sorry for you. I said, you know, it sucks. I said, you know, you, you know, you always treated me right. He, he, I go, anything I can do? And he goes, no, 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 I appreciate your loyalty. I appreciate that you came back because a lot of people are afraid to come down here. He goes, well, just do me a favor. I said, what's that? He goes, Go outside and flag me down that garbage truck. So I'm like, hey, sure. So I go outside, grab this driver. I said, look, the guy in liquidators wants to talk to you. Uh, stop in. So the uh, guy goes in. Him and Norman have a little conversation. Some money changes hands. Truck pulls up. He's telling these guys they're wheeling out all the stuff the feds missed, all the bootlegs that were on the bottom shelf, and the boxes and all the other shit. So they're basically cleaning house. So, all right, you know, like I said, I, I kept going back, and, you know, I would get deals, and, you know, the whole thing was, you had to know how to work them. 
because he wasn't going to pay. The first thing that came out of your mouth, he wasn't going to pay. Well, what happened was, a friend of mine got these typewriters and word processors, and I'm not so sure how he got them, but I wasn't going to ask any questions. But they had RB stickers on the box, which meant rebuilt. It was either RB or RF. So I'm like, he goes, I got a pile, I got all this stuff, and I'm like, oh, it's fucking refurbished junk. He goes, no, it isn't. I go, what do you mean? He goes, what happened was it was overage. And whatever this company was, and I can't remember it, just, but just think of a company that made typewriters and word processors back then, it was probably it. Um, he said, what happens is they can't fucking discount this stuff because they'd already sold it to like, you know, Walmart and Kmart and places like that and Sears. So in order to get out from under the whole overstock deal, they sold them at a discounted rate by putting the refurbished stickers on them. The trick was they weren't really refurbished because if you pulled the thing out of the box, it would have to have a refurbished sticker on the unit itself, which was some kind of law back then, but they weren't refurbished. So he gives me this whole price on the deal. I call up Norman and I guess, I don't know what I added to it, let's say a couple hundred bucks for my trouble. So. I run it by him, and he goes, too much money, and I go, okay. And he goes, what do you mean, okay? I said, I'm just passing it on, dude. You know, you do me favors, I do you favors. I said, you know, the guy has it, this is what he wants, and I said, I'm just calling you up. I said, no big whoop, I'll get a hold of somebody else and make some money on the deal. I'll call you back in a half hour. All right. What he probably did was he called around to make sure this shit was what I said it was, and then agreed to take the deal, which was fine. So, okay, I go over there and, uh, you know, like I said, half o'clock in the morning with a whole van load of this shit, and I hit a fucking bump. Not knowing anything's wrong, I keep on going. Now, I hit the intersection, all of a sudden, I got no fucking brakes, and I'm like, what the fuck? Now, I had a choice, run the red light or hit a bread truck. So, I run the red light, I pull over to the curb, I feather this thing, and I'm like, what the fuck could have happened? So, I'm on the corner of his block, so I'm like, all right, there ain't too many people around, let me just try to roll it down the block, so I get it down the block. Go in, tell them I got the shit and I got a problem. I look under the damn van, and what happened was, when I hit that pothole, the tailpipe bracket broke and went down and fucking guillotined the brake line going across the rear axle. So I'm like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to fucking do here. So he goes, what are you going to do? And I says, well, I can't stay over here. And then a cop came down, and I go, look, I got a busted brake line. And I go, mercy? And he goes, all right, I'll give you an hour, but you got to get it out of here or else you're getting towed. So I'm like, Roman goes, what are you going to do? And I said, send, go get me about a half gallon of brake fluid from someone. Send the kid down to the store, whatever. So he gets me the brake fluid. I get it up now. I was a mechanic, like I said in my book years ago, so I sort of knew how to do this. I waited until the traffic died down, and I feathered this thing back to Jersey and got it fixed. So that was one little escapade that, you know, I made money, but almost got, you know, whatever I made, I probably fucking laid out to get the damn thing fixed, so it was a wash. So another time, this guy had a shitload of perfumes, onesies and twosies. So again, I'm playing the game that I'm not making any money on it. Actually, I tacked on 500 bucks to this one because this was a fucking big score for him. So let's just say whatever the deal was, I got it for 2,000, told Norman 2,500. I forget what the whole thing suggested retail was, but I think it was like $20,000. So Whatever it was, I didn't give a shit. I, I was already making my money, so I didn't care. So I go over, I deliver the stuff. Now, usually I was going in the back, you know, where the porn was to make, you know, my order up and stuff like that. But he just had a, happened to have a shitload of CDs on the front counter that just came in. So I'm like, I'm fingering through the CDs, and I hear him on the phone because he sent the perfume out already. And he goes, yeah, yeah, you know, it's a great deal. He goes, how, how can you go wrong for five grand? So I guess my eyebrows went up at that, and he looked at me and he goes, I'm entitled to make a profit. I said, man, never said you weren't. I'm still going, weeding through the CDs, and I'm looking. He's getting nervous for some reason. All of a sudden, he goes, here, buy lunch. He slides me over a 50. So, yeah, that was pretty weird because, like I said, I already made my money, and he didn't know it, and I didn't give a shit because, you know, I don't care. If, you know, you make money on a deal I sell you, God bless you. You're entitled to it. I already made what I had to make. There's never been any animosity from me for anybody else making money on shit that I sold them to. You can do that? Fine. So now we're hitting the end of my line at the past midnight video Rockaway Marketplace because the landlord wants everybody out so they can rebuild the building. Got to be out for three months. You're out for three months. You're out of fucking business. It's that simple. 
Well, to be honest, things weren't really copacetic toward the end of it anyway because a lot of people weren't buying. A lot of other people were doing VHS, and it sort of like was hitting the wall for me because when I was getting 10 bucks a piece, three for 25 at the outdoor markets, I couldn't get five bucks a piece right about now. So I'm like, all right. So I made some arrangements. I sold all my horror and cult and stuff like that, which gave me about a thousand pieces to uh, my buddy Ken, who runs Cinema Wasteland, and he took that half off my hands. So I had a nickel dime the rest out. So one day I'm over at Norm's, and I'm, you know, I think he might have bought some of the stuff. And he goes, well, what are you going to do now? And I said, honestly, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm sort of like fucked. So he goes, listen. Um, we're doing this Atlantic City uh, East Coast video show down in Atlantic City. And he goes, why don't you come as my guest? And I said, uh, I don't know. What do you want me to do? He goes, oh, nothing. You'll have a great time. Just, you know, come over uh, Tuesday, uh, you know, bring bring a suitcase with your shit, and we'll drive down. We're, we're going to have a booth, and, you know, we'll have a good time. So I'm thinking, there's, there's got to be an ulterior motive to this, because he kept telling me how many guys wanted to go. And I'm like, yeah, okay, you go down, you sit in the porn section to meet a bunch of porn stars. He's paying for the food, he's paying for the booze, and I'm bringing my own smoke, so how bad can it be? Well, the guy who was running his adult section at the time was a guy named Zito, this Asian kid. And I didn't really know the guy that well, because another guy that, uh, named Bobby that was there before him, Bobby left, and this guy, for some reason, took over. So, okay, we go down there, and we set up this whole thing, and... This guy, for whatever reason, wasn't doing shit. Then he wanders off to get autographs from the porn stars and stuff. So I walk over to Norman and I said, you know, not for nothing. I said, what is this fucking guy supposed to be doing here? Because it don't look like he could sell fucking um, heaters to Eskimos. And he goes, that's why I brought you down here. Show me what you can do. All right. So I go into 42nd Street Pete mode because we're basically, he brought a bunch of shit with him to sell. Because he liked, he liked cash, that was the whole thing. I basically sold everything he fucking brought with him. Unbeknownst to this, you know, kid Zito, who didn't really get the whole thing, that I was being groomed for something, and I didn't even really realize I was being groomed for something. So, okay, you know, we had a good time, but, you know, this, this kid was out drinking and doing whatever, I was doing whatever, but, you know, I was walking around, you know, seeing what was going on, and, you know, networking and shit, and I think... Uh, ECW had a booth on the other side. Raven came through there, and uh, I walked up. We were talking for a while. I got a picture taken with him that has since disappeared. But uh, all right, so on the way back, Norm goes to me. He goes, I want you to come in and work for me. And I'm like, dude, I live in Lake Apatcon. That's like two and a half hours away. I got to figure something out. I go, maybe I can come in on weekends. I'll start coming on the weekends. Because you drive in on weekends, you can get away with the shit. All right, so... Started working a couple weekends, it's all right, ain't going to pay me much, but then I'm trying to figure out logistically how to get from a PatCon to New York. Well, I can take a train, got to be on the platform 4.30 in the morning, which means basically your life would consist of taking the train, going in, working, taking the train, going home, sleeping, you know, repeating. I'm like, this ain't going to fucking work this way. Plus, you know, there was another situation with a woman involved in my house and shit, but that's a whole other story. So, what I had to do was, I had to find a place closer to the city. So, I wrangled this illegal basement apartment with, with, with a massage table, a fucking coffee pot, and a microwave oven. And I basically, I stayed there for five fucking years. Uh, I wasn't paying any rent because they wanted somebody in there to make sure nobody broke into the stores up top. So um, that worked out, and some other things worked out well, but all right, now here's my uh, life now that I basically had to get up at 5.30, drink my coffee, take a shit, and hop on a fucking bus and go into New York and then walk down, you know, 8th Avenue, Broadway, whatever you want to do to get to liquidators. So, okay, I'm in there, and he gives me a list of customers and stuff like that, so I start calling people up, and they're all like, why are you calling? All we do is call the other guy. He never calls us. The guy's a douchebag. We hate dealing with him, but, you know, what are you offering? So I go, I got some deals here and there and the other thing. Well, what I don't know is this guy is a little bit fucking strange, and he's getting jealous, and he, he walks up to me, and he goes, from now on, you do what I tell you, not what Norman tells you. And I said, dude, not for nothing. You ain't signing my fucking check. He is. So whatever he wants me to do, I'm doing. 
So, a bunch of shit started going down. Plus, he had a, a girlfriend that was really young that worked in the fucking front. Well, you know, every time I made a big sale, I, you know, send the fucking paper up, they'd write up the fucking thing, and I go, ching. And this was pissing him off for some reason. It wasn't like I was putting this money in my pocket, but basically, guy would come up and he'd go, well, what do you want? Case of cheap stuff? Okay, fine. Well, guy would call up, I'd pick up the phone. Yeah, I got that, but maybe you might want this, this, and this. And I'd, oh, I'd sell the guy, because that's what I fucking do. Okay, so now this is getting fucking stupid. So, um... Him and Norman had it out. He wanted, you know, he was still in charge back there, but he, he wanted, you know, Norman wanted him to do something. He just threw the case of fucking tapes across the floor and screamed, leave me the fuck alone. So then he started mouthing off to other people that I'm a fucking rat and I'm going to get mine. And I'm like, seriously? And his big thing was he made sure everybody knew he carried a knife. So one of the guys says, what are you going to do? And I says, he wants to get fucking stupid. I'll go downstairs, but I'm going to make sure he's in front of me because when he turns around and pulls that fucking knife out, I'm going to kick his fucking teeth down his throat. I made sure he fucking heard it. So all of a sudden, he shows up dressed up a little bit, and he goes, I got a doctor's appointment. I got to go out. So he's gone an hour. Norman comes back in there, and he goes, uh, I just got a call from Bed Bath & Beyond. Zito applied for a job there. I said, what'd you do? And he goes, I gave him a great reference. He goes, but when he comes back, he's fucking fired. He goes, you got the spot. And I said, whoa, 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 back up the train. I said, not for what you're paying me. And he goes, well, you know, I'll, I'll give you a big bonus around Christmas time. And I says, what makes you think I'm going to last till Christmas time? So I said, okay, here's the deal. This is what I want. And I also don't want to pay for my stuff. He goes, what do you mean? I said, a couple of these accounts I brought in, like Kim's video in the village, if, you know, a lot of people, I don't know, maybe it's a legend now, but a lot of people at that time knew about Kim's because Kim had the greatest selection, one of the greatest selections in Manhattan for cult stuff and, you know, things like that. So, all right. I brought them in as a customer, so what I would do is, he goes, as long as it doesn't cost me money, you can do whatever you want to do. So I call up, you know, whatever, they call me, and they say, well, we need this stuff, and I said, Guess what? You got a copy of Cannibal Holocaust? I could use that. So, guy would come up to pick up the order, throw me the copy of Cannibal, copy of Cannibal Holocaust. I adjust the bill a bit, and it was all good. It was all very good. So, you know, we kept going down to Atlantic City, and doing these shows. But here's where Norm fucked up. The place is run by the Teamsters. They unload you. You have to pay a fee to get unloaded. He didn't want to do that. So basically, he had us carrying these cases of 50 VHS tapes apiece in through all this stuff, and they're getting pissed off. They're closing doors in front of us. They're doing this. They're doing that. So it wasn't going over too well. Um, yeah, we did all right. Well, one time, he had a driver named Rambo, who became my pot connection, and he was take, we were taking two van loads of stuff. Well, I got a rented van, and, you know, if it ain't my vehicle, I know how to run my vehicle, but not so much somebody else's. So I was being cautious because these rentals are pieces of shit sometimes. So I'll tell you how, what pieces of shit they are. I forgot this little fucking ditty. We go down there. Um, when I'm going down the first time, he rented a big white van, big white Ford van. All right, now I'm driving with this Asian kid, and Norman's in front of me. We're going through the Lincoln Tunnel. All of a sudden, Norman's car goes. I get stopped by the cops. I guess I look suspicious. Well, you know, the way I used to dress back then with a bandana, shades, and a cut-off Levi vest, yeah, I look suspicious. So he goes, uh, what are you carrying? And I says, what, up, batting an eye? I go, oh, about uh, 10,000 uh, VHS pornographic tapes. And he goes, excuse me? And I said, what I just said, about 10,000 uh, VHS pornographic tapes. He goes, step out of the vehicle. Okay. I'd open the door, had him check it, da -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. and I said, now you just fucked me. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, my boss was in front of me. He took off. I go, i got to be at a show at Atlantic City, and I don't know where the hell he is, and I don't know how to get there. So they must have made some kind of call and verified that there was indeed a show in Atlantic City. So they finally let me go, so I'm hoping. I hope this motherfucker pulled into a rest area. So I see him in a rest area once you get, you know, when you, I guess it was, oh, I don't know, the first one you hit on the turnpike. So he goes, what happened? I says, tell him. And I says, you know, next time maybe you would have rent a purple van instead of the white abduction van because it seems like they're just pulling over white vans for some reason. All right, so, you know, we get down there, whatever. But, you know, the whole comedy error started, like I said, with Rambo racing me there and he getting there first and him having the team throughs unload him. And I'm like, 
You had them unload you? I'm like, what are you, out of your fucking... He goes, I said, dude, he's going to be fucking pissed. So I unload my shit, and uh, okay, we do another show, which became uh, almost a comedy of errors, because I got drunk the first night on Blackberry Brandy, which was a bad mistake. Uh, Tony got drunk the second night, and Alex got drunk the third night. So we were at... Bill Margold was down there, and this was um, right after 9-11, and the thing was that nobody from the West Coast flew out. All we were getting was East Coast guys. It was like one rat, after, one rat after, you know, seven rats after one piece of cheese. There wasn't enough pie to go around. We weren't going to make any money. So we get invited to this party by Bill Marigold. You know, there's going to be all these porn starlets there, this and that and the other thing. But we get picked up by a Tommy Chong double who drove us around. He's drinking vodka out of a fucking Poland Spring bottle. It took about an hour to get a half hour away. We get there, and I'm like, holy shit, man, this motherfucker is not taking us back. So we go in there, and basically it was a sausage fest. The girls never showed up. Whatever refreshments he had were fucking gone, and we're like, okay, fuck this. So now we're getting fucking shit-faced drunk. We leave. We go down there. That idiot's waiting for us, and we said, we rear of the kid behind him, and there's some Asian guy, and he goes, did you, that guy take you here? We go, yeah, he was fucking drinking, you know, drinking on the fucking job and shit. And I said, that's why we got in your cab. And the guy goes, you crazy, he's one crazy motherfucker. You're, you're, you're better off with me. So Alex, this black dude, was with us, and he was an aspiring porn star. And he knew where this party was with, you know, people and everything else. So, all right, so we go to this, you know, bar. There's some huge fucking bouncers there. There's live a live sex show going on behind the bar and shit. Like, I'm pretty much numb to all this stuff. But Alex is, you know, he's hooking up, and all of a sudden, Tony's in the back, and he's, like, so drunk, he's percolating. And I'm like, you are right, dude? And he goes, I don't know, I'm in one of those moods. He goes, I either want to fight, fuck, or gamble. So I'm like, all right, ain't no gambling here. You get in a fight here, we're going to be fucking dead, so uh, let's see what we can do here. So I go find Alex, and I go, look, I go, Tony's hitting critical fucking mass. He's fucking bombed. Now, as I'm talking to him, I'm wearing a leather vest, and I got a button. Well, this chick bumps into me wearing a bikini top, and part of the bikini top string hooks onto my fucking button. And she's walking away, and her top's pulling off. I'm like, no, and all of a sudden, these bounces surround me. I'm like, look, this thing just got hooked here. Bup, 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 bup. She's like, hee, 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 I'm like, Alex, we got to get the fuck out of here. So we go out front, and he's trying to get a cab. Tony's so fucked up, he's pissing on the side of the fucking bar and shit. So we finally wrangle a fucking cab. We get back, and Tony staggers out. He's going to go fucking gamble. And Alex goes, what are you going to do? I said, fuck him. I'm done. He goes, well, I, I, got, I got this chick waiting for me. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, go hook up. And I'm like, dude, I'm just going to get some fucking sleep because we got one more day of this shit, and it's over. So I don't know what really happened with Tony, but supposedly he lost five grand playing fucking blackjack, and he was so shit-faced he fell off the fucking stool, which really they shouldn't let him fucking gamble. So he comes back, he's all fucked up. He finally falls asleep. It's about 3 o'clock in the fucking morning. I'm just about ready to nod, nod out. And the fucking door flies open, and it's Alex. No shirt, no shoes, just his pants. Grabs the phone, picks it up, starts screaming at some fucking chick, and I'm like, what the fuck happened now? He goes, ah, everything was fucking hot and heavy. We were fucking cool. He goes, I'm starting to bang her, and she wants 200 bucks. And I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. So I go, well, so what happened? He goes, she threw me out of the fucking room. So I said, well, how'd you get back? And he goes, I fucking walked. I said, why'd you get a cab? And he goes, what cab's going to pick up a black dude like me with no shirt and no shoes on at 2.30 in the morning? And I said, you're right, you may get some fucking sleep. So I guess the next day he resolved that because I saw him hanging out with her. But we finally get back to fucking New York and shit like that. And uh, that was, uh, I think we might have, well, see, now here was the fuck up. Because of the Teamsters thing, Norman gets a bill for 600 bucks and he refuses to pay it. So the next show, he cannot do the show, is New York City Liquidators. So he goes, give me a good name for a store. And I said, DVD Dynasty. He goes, that's what we'll be, DVD Dynasty. So we go through the whole fucking rigmarole of carrying this shit in, but now here's, here's where he fucked himself. We get an order and we say, well, don't make out the check to DVD Dynasty, make it out to New York City Liquidators. All of a sudden, we ain't doing any fucking business because he didn't really put two and two together. So... I think that was the last time we fucking did that, and he had entrenched the girlfriend down there somewhere in a hotel or, you know, whatever, it, some apartment thing they used to, you know, he was down there, he'd go knock off a piece. 
So basically, toward the end, we made one last trip down there, and it was basically somebody gave us badges to go in, and he just went to the hotel, and I wandered around the floor, and then he wanted to go home, and that was the end of it. I don't, you know, then they, I think they don't even think they have the show anymore, but you know, that was just one little segment. And the other segment was, you know, basically, once Zito left, it was like, all right, we got to do something about me dealing with fucking assholes. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, because you got these guys coming in, you know, you let them buy a dozen tapes for two bucks a piece, but then they buy six, they want six for two bucks a piece. You let them buy it, then I add it up, and it comes to 12, and they say I'm fucking them. I said, I can't deal with some of these fuckers. Plus, they had a couple, you know, they had some bad fucking people come in there. I mean, like, really bad. Um, that You know, I, there was a VCR built into a TV, and this one big one would come in and arrogantly want these tapes played, and he'd sit there watching them. Well, Zito was afraid of them. Honestly, so was I, because his big thing was when somebody pissed him off, I'll cut you, motherfucker. So I broke the fucking VCR. So he came in one day, and he goes, I said, VCR's broken. He goes, when are you going to get it fixed? I said, ain't my call. Ask Norman. So basically, I don't know what happened. I never saw the guy again. Maybe he got pissed off and never came back, or maybe he came back on Saturdays when I wasn't there because I wasn't working a fucking, you know, six-day week. Got to have one day off anyway. So, um... There was another guy, uh, he was funny, this guy Kevin, he was another cokehead. Uh, he came in there all fucked up one day, and he was yelling about how we never give him anything, this and that, and the other thing, and like, shit's dripping out of his fucking nose. And there was a bunch of broken fucking dildos, and I handed him one, I go, here, take it. Oh, thank you very much, puts it in his back pocket and walks out. Another time, he's in there, and he was a pimp at one point, and there was some college kid in there, because we were close to FIT and a couple other schools. And he started talking about this whole pimp thing, and it was like, I wish I had recorded this, because it was great shit about how you can tell when a girl, you know, the girl's going to be able to turn out and shit like that. And he's going through this whole fucking thing, and I'm leaning in the doorway, you know, because it was a separation between the regular store and the porn. And he gets done with his whole thing, and I hit the quote from, you know, the WWE Godfather character that, hey, pimping ain't easy, and everybody cracks up. Then this kid leaves, and Kevin goes, I think you owe me money for that, chases him down the block. So... The other thing was, too, but you never know who might show up in the store. Frank Hennenlotter was from Basket Case, was a regular customer. So he'd come there with a bunch of guys I know. We'd always shoot the shit. And um, one day I'm leaving, and Ox Baker, the wrestler, uh, and Star of Skate from New York, is set up with a table on the corner selling some shit. And I'm like, wow, what are you doing over here? So the guy I was with him said, well, you know, he just beat colon cancer, and he's pretty fucking broke. So I was still with Chiller at the time, so I got him into Chiller. But he used to show up regularly, like bellowing and then calling me on the phone. This is the fantastic Ox Baker. So one day he came in and was roaring and stuff like that, and uh, he was hitting on some lady behind the counter, and to impress her, he took his teeth out and put her on the counter. So yeah, he was in there, and then uh, one time, I guess Chris Rock wanted to use the adult part of it for a movie. So Norman tells me, yeah, they're going to shoot a movie in here. you you, you got to stay home. And I said... Am I getting paid? He goes, no. And I said, then I'm coming in. He goes, no, no, you got to stay home. And I said, again, am I getting paid? He goes, all right, I'll fucking pay you. Stay home. He goes, oh, whatever. So I guess, you know, they closed the store up. And I don't know what movie they shot there because I never saw it. But I know I wasn't in it. And then one of his regulars was this uh, black porn star named Minaj who basically had a fucking tongue that came down to here. Well, that was her big attraction. I mean, she was a nice lady and all that. He brought her in a couple times to hang out and sign autographs. Then uh, Abel Ferrara from uh, Bad Lieutenant and MS-45 was looking for a location to sh set a camera up in a store window and shoot out at the street, which we had. So Norm's uh, son-in-law was uh, on law and disorder. He was like a technical guy on law and disorder with lighting and stuff like that. So he sent Ferrara's guy down, and they sent Ferrara down, and nothing was ever done about it. I showed him wh where it was, and basically said, you can get a guy in here on a camera, but, uh, you know, they never came back as far as I know. Then one day, Mel Brooks walked in, and I'm like, hey, you're, he goes, I want a copy of that uh, DVD gung-ho that's in the window, can I have that, please? I said, certainly. Rang him up, sent him out, and like, you know, never said shit. Should have asked him for an autograph, but like Norm says, he goes, you know, some guys just don't want to be bothered, don't want to be noticed. I said, yeah, fine. Um, porn people came in occasionally, um, mob people came in. You know, you'd see that. Um, you never know. So it was always always interesting to see who would walk through the door. Plus, you know, a lot of crazy shit went on. Um, 
you know, the whole thing was he was getting stuff, you know, through various sources, and one of the sources he was tapping, he got a hold, was getting all this uh, VHS stuff from some place in California. Um, don't want to say the name of the company on camera because they may still be in operation, but all this stuff was supposedly supposed to be destroyed. So we get these cases that say degassed tapes on them, which were, I guess, supposed to be erased. So he was buying a lot of this stuff, except that one load he got a fucking half the load was these Green Bay Packers tapes. Well, he got on the phone with this guy, they're going back and forth, and was basically ended with, fuck you, I'll never deal with you again, and hung up. So, as all Norm's mistakes go, they wind up in the fucking basement, where I either forgot about him or had to deal with him down the road. So, you know, he'd get a quarter for these damn tapes, he'd take it, but, I mean, we had a shitload of these fucking tapes. Probably in the area of 10,000 of them. But, we were going to get saved, because what happened was, uh, America's mayor, Rudolph Giuliani, complete jerk-off that he is, passed a law for the porn stores, this, the famous 60-40 law, where basically 60% of the store could be adult, but the rest of it had to be mainstream. So all of a sudden, these Green Bay Packer tapes were getting going for a buck and a half, because these stores wanted anything they could stick in there, and they didn't want, didn't give a shit whether it would sell. Matter of fact, they must have taken this whole concept of the 60-40 thing nationwide because one of my customers in Florida called me up and he goes, I can't use junk. I need current movies. He goes, but I don't want to pay a lot for them. And I said, well, what I got is I got a bunch of broken movies in original boxes. And he goes, can you shrink wrap them? And I go, yeah. And he goes, well, I'll give you two bucks a piece for them. So I clear it with Norm because what the fuck was better than trying to fix the goddamn things. So... I said, you know, what if, what if somebody buys me? He goes, I'm putting eighty nine ninety five a piece on him. He goes, nobody's going to buy him. They're just going to be in the front of the store. So, you know, basically, we could we we could sell any fucking non porn piece of shit to anybody at that point because they basically needed a bunch of shit in the front of the store to you know to uh, you know, abide by the law. So, yeah, Giuliani, um, asshole that he is. Uh, there was a show in New York at the Javits Center called the Sex Boat, which was a really classy affair. And, of course, Norm jumped on this because, you know, we were only up the block from it. And we went in, and basically it was a three-day show, and we sold $25,000 worth of porn. And I ran into my buddy Jack Ketchum there, Joe Fleischaker, Trauma's Biggest Star was there, and Al Goldstein was there. So... I was talking with Al, and there's Giuliani out in front of the place having a press conference, fucking frothing at the mouth about how this obscene fucking show got in under his nose. And Al's going, well, you know something? He goes, this fucking guy's an asshole. He's calling this a sleazy event. He goes, this is a classy event. He goes, there's only one thing sleazy. Well, no, there's two things sleazy here, me and you. I took that as a compliment. So the Sexpo deal was... You know, they were going to do something in, in San Francisco, and he wanted to go. And I said, that's the same weekend as Chiller. And I said, you know you make money at Chiller. And he goes, yeah, we made 25 k here. And I said, that does not necessarily mean it's going to happen there. Well, he's all fucking psyched to go, and he goes, well, I know you're going to do Chiller because, you know, you get a payoff for that. But he goes, pack me up a bunch of shit. We're going to do it. Well, I packed him up what I thought would, would fucking sell. But basically, he went over there, he tanked it, and he blamed it on what... I sent him, and I said, no. I said, it ain't my fault. Don't even go that route. And I said, you got fucking greedy because you made a killing in New York. And I said, you would have made a killing at fucking Chiller, but you had it fucking figure out you're going to get do better over there. And unfortunately, you didn't. So, no, it ain't my fucking fault. So that backed him off a bit. But um, trying to think now, we segue into a bunch of shit going back. Uh, there's always stories. And there's basically the best reality show would have been having a camera and liquidators because... There was customers beating on people. There was help beating on people. There was, there was fights would break out. People would be screaming at each other. It, it was nuts. It, it was like a completely dysfunctional environment. Um, one time, one of these guys took a swing at one of the cashiers, this small girl named Pamela. And, all right, you know, fucking do that. And I backed this asshole out. I pit bulled him out chest to chest, got him up against the fucking truck. And it's like, what do I do? And somebody yells, hit the motherfucker. He tried to hit that chick. And I'm like, I ain't going to hit him. He's a fucking pussy. I go, I'm going back in the store. So I'm figuring, I'm going back in the store for 
another reason that I don't want to get myself in a jackpot out here. So I go back in the store and this idiot follows me back in and screams, the only reason you people work here is because you're a bunch of losers. And I'm like, okay, well, what's your fucking point? Get the fuck out of the store. I chase him out again. So he never came back in. So a eh, bunch of strange shit, people trying to get over, and you, know, you just, you know, you couldn't let them get over on you. That was the big thing. Um, you know, there was two price points on some of this cheap crap and you know, the before hour compilations were hot for some reason, which I, I thought they sucked, but that's me. So some were three fifty, some were four dollars. So this one dude came in and I noticed he changed the fucking bill before he went up front. So I walked up and I says, No, no, you got the four dollar shit, not the three fifty shit. So we go back and forth yelling at each other, we fucking storms out. Norman goes, Well, that wasn't very smart. I said, What do you mean? He goes, You should have got me on the side before you fucking said something. He goes, Because he just got out of jail for manslaughter. So I'm like, oh, fuck me. And now everybody knows this shit. Everybody's seen me do it. So I go home thinking, well, what are we going to do about this? I said, if I back down, I'm fucked. And I said, if I don't back down, I get the shit beat out of me. So I said, I'll opt for getting the shit beat out of me and see what happens. Okay, so a couple days go by, and then finally he comes in. I walk right up to him. I go, you know, you and I may have a problem right now, and I, we can settle it one of two ways. I go, we can go outside and beat the shit out of each other, which ain't going to fucking solve nothing. Or you can just forget about it, and I can show you how to make some money. So he goes, you can show me how to make some money. I said, yeah, I know tricks too. So I showed him a few of my fucking tricks, and I actually became friends. And he was one of the only people who bought me a fucking bottle around Christmas time. So, you know, I turned shit to my advantage because, you know, you didn't want to show weakness over there. So what sucked was that Norm was not doing well, and his kidneys fucking failed. And he was on dialysis, and he was out of the store a lot. So... He got this guy that was a boyfriend of his, the nurse at the dialysis unit, this guy, Tiny, who just got out of jail. Well, Tiny was anything but Tiny. And, you know, Tiny was okay, but the problem was with the whole environment there, Tiny was into drugs. And if you went three blocks down, there was a lot of fucking drugs. And I know that not because... I did drugs because I didn't. I was always a weed head, but every once in a while he'd have some shaky asshole that he'd hire that would all of a sudden suspiciously have to go somewhere, and then he'd give me the high sign, and I'd follow the guy down there and see him selling something he just clipped to get dope. So I'd go back, tell Norman to fire his ass when he comes back in the door, and that was it. So that's how I knew about it. So, you know, Tiny and I got along. I turned him on to some fucking movies and shit, and then he offered... Uh, me to, you know, if I wanted to fuck his sister, which all I had this visual of is tiny with tits, so I politely declined, plus I was with somebody at the point, at that point in time. So what happened was, one day, tiny drops Norman off, and is supposed to pick him up at three o'clock. Well, three o'clock comes, four o'clock comes, five o'clock comes, there's no tiny. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you, dude. I go, either something happened or he's gone. So he goes, I don't know what to do. And I said, look, I know you're loyal to the guy. I know you're a street guy. I said, so am I. I said, but the bottom line is, he's got your car. It's registered under your name. It's your insurance. If he fucks up, it's going to be on you. So he has to report the car stolen. Well, it winds up a couple weeks later, they find the car in Florida, and Tiny's back in jail. I really think from talking to Tiny, because it looks like he spent a lot of time in jail, that he really couldn't handle what to do on the outside, and he might have purposely fucked up to just get back on the inside. So, but like I said, I liked the guy, you know, he was all right with me, and I always judge people like that. So, but like I said, then Norm had to have a triple bypass. So he was out a lot, and stuff was going on in the fucking store that wasn't cool, couple guys were making fucking deals on their own. Um, I think the icing on the cake came. Uh, he had to have part of his foot amputated. And the thing was, he had to be in that, he was one of those guys, he had to be in that fucking store. I, I don't think he was, you know, happy to be home. I didn't think he wanted to be with his old lady. He just wanted, this was his thing. He, you know, it was, it was an environment. He was the king there. I get it. But what I asked him to do was, every time he opened the fucking door, wind blows on him, and I says, at least let me move the checkout counter to the other side of the fucking store. No, he didn't want to do it. So, like I said, you know, we were tight, and another thing that came up was we were talking about the whole fucking bust and, you know, all the money they found, and he goes to me in confidence, which I can say now because he's no longer with us, that the amount of money confiscated was a lot more than they, they posted, 
which probably is why he didn't spend too much time behind bars because they cut the pie up. I mean, he said he they reported three hundred seventy something thousand dollars they picked up. He said it was double that amount. So that's how legit you know things are over there, and probably worse now. But he started ailing, and the whole thing was. He had made good his fucking connection back out in California. That guy flew out. They made peace. And we were getting some fucking great stuff, like the broken up um, anchor base sets, all the all this, this great horror stuff. And like, I was going fucking shopping. Well, then he made another connection with a guy up in Canada. And we were getting, you know, whatever the deal was, guy would get a truck into the States with a full shitload of fucking DVDs and VHS tapes. And he'd go back with a bag of cash. So, uh, if I was slow on my side, I go over there. I saw all this shit come in, and I'm like, "Wow, MGM Midnight Movies, this and that." And I said, "You want me to count this stuff, Norm? I'm pretty quiet on my side. I can give you a hand." He goes, "Yeah, go ahead." So I look at the invoice. It's supposed to be three thousand something DVDs, and I'm counting like close to six thousand. I'm getting five and change. So I walk up and I said, "Discrepancy in the bill." And he goes, "Forget you ever told me that." I'm like, "Okay." So I'm still going shopping. So. One day he was out, and the guy from Canada called me up. His name was Vito, and he was from Toronto. Put two and two together. So we're talking, and I says, oh, yeah, it's, it's going good. You know, it's great stuff. You know, glad we, glad we, you know, made the connection, this and that, and the other thing. So then his bookkeeper started questioning the amounts on the fucking invoices and stuff. I turned around, and I says, listen, Mark. I said, do your fucking homework. I said, the guy's name's Vito. He owns a container company, AKR Garbage Disposal Company. Up in Toronto, I said, what do you, who do you think you're dealing, we're dealing with? Well, we're probably dealing with the Canadian mob, but who gave a fuck? You know, the way I look at it is we saved all this cool shit from going into a landfill. I mean, we were getting Sopranos, box sets, Band of Brothers box sets, all this great shit. And the whole thing was, at that point in time, that, you know, we knew VHS was on the fucking way out. So... Norm wanted to get out of the place and downsize, but only take me, one other guy, and a couple couple to help with him, and just do DVDs. And the way it would have panned out, that nobody would have beat our price for a DVD in New York City. So, before that happened, you know, we had 9-11, which, you know, I sort of hate talking about, but I will, because that day, like everybody else, nobody fucking knew it was coming down. I'm in the back, I came in early, and, you know, they had a TV on. Now, usually they put in a movie, you know, before, you know, we got busy, and they'd watch a fucking movie. So that's what I thought I was watching when I saw this plane crash into the fucking tower. And I'm like, what movie is this? And all of a sudden, the guy comes flying out of the back room. We're under attack. Well, that was it. You know the story. We saw the second tower come down from the roof of our building. I was like, game fucking over, but you couldn't get out of Manhattan. Norm could, because he was going to Long Island. They could go that way, but couple of us were still, you know, like I said, I had that illegal apartment in Jersey, so I was in there, and the other two guys were there, so we went to the path station, and the path station's closed, and one guy was at him, and he was staying there, and I said, well, I'm going to Port Authority, so the guy goes with me, we go to Port Authority, and Port Authority's barricaded, and he goes, what now, and I says, bar, so we go in a bar, have a couple drinks, and I'm like, okay, everything's fucking calm now, I said, but, you know, when the sun goes down, it may not be so fucking calm. So he goes, what do you think we should do? This guy's name was Tony. So I said, I think we should go to Penn Station and see if we can get out from there. And I says, if we can't get out of there, I think we go back to the store and barricade ourselves in and hope for the best. So we caught the last train out of Penn Station into Newark, New Jersey. And we're in Penn Station down there. And it's like a fucking war zone. There's tanks, there's jeeps, there's salt national guardsmen, there's all over the place. So we're like, okay. We're in Newark, and Newark is one city you don't want to be in after dark, no matter what color you are. So we finally get a cab, and he gets, I go, take me to, to Lynnhurst, where my place is, and I'll drive Tony home. Well, Route 3 is barricaded going toward Lynnhurst. The guy goes the other way, and I'm like, but he goes, I'm going to take him home. I says, where's that going to leave me? And he goes, I don't know. I said, stop the cab. He goes, what? I said, stop the fucking cab. I'll walk back. So... Long story short, I walked the five miles back, past the barricade, had the Clifton cops scream at me. At this point, I'm fucking done. I just yelled, why don't you just fucking shoot me and get it over with? So I got back in, and uh, I stayed out the one day. Nobody else did, but I had family and friends that wanted to see that I was okay. And my whole thing was, everybody was going, well, you really shouldn't go back to work there. And our thing is, 
If I don't go back to work, that means they win. And they're not going to win with me because I don't give a fuck whether my job's non-essential or whatever. I said, nobody fucking tells me what I, what I have to do. Terrorists, whatever. Nobody's telling me where I'm going to be or what I have to do. So I went back in. But like I said, you know, then the next thing was the fucking blackout on top of that, which, you know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the fucking power goes off. And I'm like, okay... For some reason, they closed Port Authority, they closed all this shit, and they're telling people to go down by the pier. And I'm like, why the fuck are they going down by the pier? So I'm like walking down, and I see a bus stop that says Sea Caucus, which is close to where I live. And I said, can I get on this? I got a pass. And he goes, yeah, but they're not letting anybody through the tunnel. And I go, why not? And he goes, why don't you ask the cop? He laughing. And I said, you know, I will. So I walk up to the cop and I said, how come you're not letting anybody go through the tunnel? And he goes, well, the power's off. And I said, well, what's that got to do with anything? He goes, there's no lights. And I said, officer, not for nothing, but those two things on the front of the bus are called headlights. And they, and he goes, all right, why is he asking get back on the bus? Then he let us through. So that was like another one. You know, it started getting to the point where, all right, what's going to happen? So it, now we're coming up on the weekend of Chiller where I was involved in filming Unconventional. And I had my phone off. Well, Norm was in the hospital. He had brought back a guy who I didn't really fucking trust. And we had words over the phone before I left for the fucking weekend. And I still regret that conversation till this day because it was the last conversation I had with him. I was only looking out for his best interests, but he brought back a guy who I knew was fucking clipping. And I went off on him. I said, I'm trying to hold this place together while you're fucking sick. And you bring back a guy who's basically going to clean the fucking joint out. So... All right, I had my phone off. Sunday, I turned my phone off. I get a, uh, three messages from the girl who worked behind the counter. Pete, you got to call me. Second message, Pete, you got to call me. Pete, Norm's dead. And I'm like, what the fuck happened? I call her up, and he was in the hospital, and he started the fucking code, and they started to shove something down his throat, and he ripped it out saying, I'd rather die than go through this, and he died. So to be honest with you, I was fucking devastated. I cried my eyes out. I had to go back, uh, went to the funeral, they wanted me to come in and help liquidate the place, they made me a promise of a certain amount of money, which I guess they had promised Rambo the same thing, so we were dumping stuff left and right, I was calling guys I knew and giving them great deals, and then Rambo clued me and he goes, they're going to fuck us at the end of the day, and I said, really? He goes, they're going to fuck us, trust me. So I made sure that enough merchandise went out with a friend of mine's straight job that had my name on each case, a big P on each case, so I wouldn't get fucked. And I was right. At the end of the day, they fucked me. They told me to take my severance in product. They ran a rigged auction, which basically they sold it to a guy who Norman knocked heads with for years, and the guy came back to gloat and told me that everything here, I said, shit's in my desk is mine, dude. And I says, you know something? You won. You got over. And I says... Do yourself a big fucking favor and walk away from me before I personally take this bat and shove it up your fucking ass. So, at that time I was fucking done. I walked up to his family members that were still there. I said, look, just pay me the fuck off. I want out of here. I said, you people fucking suck. And that was it. So, unfortunately, that was the end of uh, Liquidators. And there's probably a shitload more stories I could tell, which, you know, probably in my next book. There's a lot went on there, but... Um, I miss the guy, I really do, he's like a brother to me, and like working in New York for five years straight was like a whole experience that I would have never had, you know, had things fallen into place, so uh, that's the strange and terrible saga of New York City liquidators, so we'll see you on the flip side, stay sick.